And also another thing I want to touch on too is kind of the what it's like to experience this in Los Angeles, also a city that's hallmarked for hedonism, the pursuit of personal pleasure, putting yourself first and your pleasures first and foremost, and the cultural reaction and the cultural perspective is in some ways bringing out darker sides of humanity. You're listening to the From Here to Wear podcast. From Here to Wear is a community of goal getters and dream chasers. We're transitioning into our 20s, first jobs, scary bosses, talking all things from sex, dating, relationships, wellness, to networking and finances, the ups, the downs, and everything in between. These interviews are bundled with the tips and tricks you definitely didn't learn in school, hearing from those who have come before us, helping us navigate from here to where. Okay. It's been a minute since I've done a podcast episode. I think a mixture of writer's block and the world ending and just me trying to figure out my life, I guess. I don't know. Um, But I'm bringing you a special episode. uh, Really has nothing to do with career stories or boss babe women or whatever it is I normally talk about. I'm coming to you straight from my living room. Uh, It's rainy Los Angeles. I'm in sweats. I'm not wearing makeup. It's cold and eerie outside and it doesn't really feel like typical Los Angeles. I'm sure it's kind of the same situation um, across the entire U.S., across the world. It just doesn't really feel normal at all. Um, Yeah, it's been incredibly gloomy and apocalyptic here in L.A., Um, but one of my friends described this time as the couple of days between Christmas and New Year's where you have time off work and you're really not sure what to do with yourself, and it's like a time warp. It's Groundhog's Day and... There's just enough tension to cut it with a knife. I don't know. It's surreal. I mean, I guess the purpose of this episode, I just wanted to share what it's like to experience coronavirus in the second largest city in the U.S., what it looks like and what it feels like here right now. And I mean, for a city that makes movies, I feel like we're all living in a horror movie right now. Um, It's a lot. It's intense. It's kind of this awkward thing where... Nobody likes talking about politics or telling a partner you contracted an STD. It's like one of those awkward conversations to have where you don't want to insult someone. You want to stay healthy. You want to take care of yourself. You don't really know the severity of what's happening. So you don't want to seem like you're overreacting or underreacting. You don't want to be seen as crazy for stockpiling your pantry, but you also have no idea what's to come. You don't want to be left without food. It's just all of these different mind games that, you know, we have with ourselves, we have with society. And I have no doubt this time is going to be recorded in history books. Of course, that's a given. But what's more interesting to me is kind of this social experiment we're in right now. It's this weird dance where we're trying to all act sane and hopefully try to be rational about things. But of course, emotions get involved and feelings and it's just, it's complicated. Um, I think we can all agree nobody was fully prepared for this. Our minds were not prepared. Our hospitals, the supplies, the testing, the respirators. I mean, we have no idea where this is going to go, but it's a global pandemic. And I think now people are taking it seriously, um, I hope. And I mean, the one thing, we're all in this together. Um, And also another thing I want to touch on too is kind of the what it's like to experience this in Los Angeles, also a city that's hallmarked for hedonism, the pursuit of personal pleasure, putting yourself first and your pleasures first and foremost, and kind of this mentality of like thinking for yourself. I mean, I know that's stereotyping LA. I love this city. I love living here, but the cultural reaction and the cultural perspective is in some ways bringing out darker sides of humanity. And I know we we're in a moment where we want to be listening and hearing positive things. And I'm going to try to make this positive. I really am. But I also kind of want to record my thoughts and my feelings of what I'm experiencing in LA almost as a way to 
time capsule this because when this, and hopefully sooner rather than later, but when this all blows over, I want to remember what it was like in this time and what I was feeling and what I'm noticing. And this is my worldview. You don't have to agree with me. You don't have to listen to this. Go listen to something else. I don't care. This is kind of for me to remember and paint a picture of what it's like here. Um, you know, 20 years from now, I can go back and listen to this and remind myself of what it was like to live during this time that will definitely be recorded in history. So of course it's not the typical LA. Um, first I kind of just want to start with what it feels like and what it looks like. Um, you know, and what a beautiful thing that I'm recording this podcast episode and you can be in a state far, far from here, how you can have this podcast and how I can just communicate with people who are very far from me and, um, can share what my experience is like. And I'm also so curious to know what this is like for you and where you live. If you're in a small town or if you're on the East coast or in the South or in a different, uh, country, even, you know, I think it's been really interesting to see friends on social media through my travels. I've met friends in Italy and France and Canada, and they're telling me, of course, other cities and countries too, but those are the ones that I've been in touch with uh, where it's been hit hard in Ireland too. And just to hear what it's like uh, to experience this in a different country that's farther along than we are here now in the U.S., um, we talk about we're on trend to follow Italy or these other countries that are hit hard with the disease and what they're experiencing and what it's like for them and how nobody took it seriously. And now the hospitals are packed. People are quarantined in Italy. They aren't allowed to leave their houses without a written notice. Um, they can only go get food and medicine and you're supposed to stay home. And so people are saying that's what two weeks from now will look like in the U.S. But also it's interesting um, to compare in countries like China where there are quarantines and mandates from the government and in a totalitarian society, um, in a communist society like China, how the mentality shift is to listen to the government, to follow the precautions out of fear, out of tradition and norm, to follow government you know, mandates. And what would that look like here in the U S you know, what would that look like if the government did that people would riot the American mentality, the American philosophy is very independent and don't tread on me and don't tell me what to do. And so it's just a social experiment that nobody really will be able to know or understand until it happens. But, uh, the grocery stores, I'll start with that in LA. I think that was the first thing the first like, oh shit moment where I was like, okay, this is real. Um, the grocery stores, I went to a Ralph's grocery store at like 10 PM, um, last week, last Wednesday, I think. And that was when I realized, uh, this is going to be big because the grocery store was packed at 10 PM. I don't know about you. That doesn't seem like a normal time to go to the grocery store. I, I know LA is a big city and busy, but I went there thinking, okay, this is going to be a good time. It's not going to be busy. Uh, first thing, couldn't find a spot in the parking lot. Um, then I couldn't find a shopping cart. There were no shopping carts. Uh, all of the hand sanitizer wipes were uh, empty. You know, at the entrance of the store, they usually have hand sanitizer wipes. Those were gone. Um, and the grocery store was packed. And the shelves were incredibly bare. Um, they weren't completely bare as they are now. But things were just, you know, being taken off the shelves. People's carts were packed to the brim full of cans and supplies. And there, I didn't see any hand sanitizer. I couldn't find soap. I couldn't find toilet paper. I couldn't find paper towels. Now we all know that's pretty normal. Um, all of those things have been stockpiled. Um, and it was like a horror movie. People were wearing face masks. Um, now when we go in the stores a few days later, I've been back, um, to target and there's signs posted, you know, please for the, for the sake of others, only take what you need. We're limiting toilet paper and paper towels to, you know, three or one, depending on where you are per customer, please don't take more than you need. So there's been a little bit of a response to that because I think the panic set in on that Wednesday when the NBA canceled the season. And that's, I think, kind of like an oh shit moment for everyone. So for me, 
I noticed it first with the grocery stores, um, just people buying things in bulk and, um, yeah, just that. I also ordered groceries on the Walmart app, um, after that happened because I kind of panicked a little bit and I was like, okay, well I got supplies that I needed. I was one of the people that stocked up on canned goods and pasta. And now a lot of the items that I bought last week, uh, are no longer in grocery stores, um, from what I've seen. So I'm thankful I went at the time I did. Um, but then I also ordered more on a Walmart app, um, to pick up groceries and that was on like a Wednesday or Thursday. And it wouldn't be until that Monday, uh, it would be available for pickup. And then yesterday I got an email, sorry, your order was canceled. So all of those items that I was planning to pick up at Walmart, um, from like the delivery or the pickup app canceled. So that's a little creepy, but of course everything is, there's nothing there in the stores for them to package or to have for a pickup delivery. Uh, the streets in LA, um, normally LA is full of cars and traffic and just people walking about and it's been a ghost town. Um, people have been working from home, social distancing. That's been a big thing. Uh, this has hashtag has gone viral. Uh, stay the hashtag, stay the fuck at home. Uh, makes sense. Uh, I think people at first thought it was a little silly or maybe like, okay, I guess we're going to work from home. Now it's completely accepted. It's the norm. Um, I work from home anyway as a freelancer. Um, and then also have a part-time job where I help out at my friend's business and it's been slower than normal. Um, I think maybe people have been canceling their appointments. I don't know. It's just trying to remain calm and remain normal. Um, but then still feeling like obligated to come into work. Um, I really feel for the people who have jobs that you can't work from home where you have to be in person. Some of my friends are servers and work in the restaurant industry. And we just got the announcement yesterday that in LA, all bars and restaurants will be closed until at least March 31st until further notice. Um, and so what do you do if you have a job where you can't work from home, you can't telecommute, uh, you need to be in person, you know, what are those people going to do for money? What if they don't have savings? What if they have a family to provide for? Uh, what if, you know, they, they can't make their rent or they can't put food on the table. And then now schools are closed. My mom is a teacher. Um, she's at home with my dad. I'm helping my dad who, has a pre-existing condition and has ALS and caregivers. And it's almost a blessing that she can be home with him instead of in the classroom. Um, but yeah, her school was canceled. LA schools are canceled. What about the kids who rely on, you know, free and reduced lunch or get their breakfast at school because their parents can't provide it for them? You know, there will be kids going hungry. It's just a snowball effect of, of what's happening. Um, it's crazy. Um, and then also the culture, I think what's so interesting being in a city like Los Angeles, a city that is extravagant and people go out every night of the week and, you know, being social is just, you know, what you do in LA. And it's hard for people to accept that going out is not smart and it's hard it's hard to tell your friends that it's hard to accept that for yourself because who likes to be home? Nobody likes to be home doing nothing. Um, so the culture I think is, is really interesting how people went from ignoring this to blaming social media as adding to the hysteria and the fake news and, Oh, this will all blow over. It felt black and white a week ago. Like either we're all dying or this is stupid. Stop worrying it. You're dumb for caring. And then now people taking it seriously. Um, and there's still just that tension. I feel like for the lack of a better word, I just, it feels tense, you know, because everybody has a different way to cope and react with this. Um, but I think if there's a silver lining, I think social media, you know, it's such a giant and social media is a beautiful thing and it's an ugly thing, but thank God we can communicate from the comfort of our own homes that we can get news and information, um, not from a physical newspaper, but from our inboxes and online and that we have FaceTime and texting and Instagram and all of these things that we can stay in touch and kind of feel connected with the world and know what's going on without leaving our homes. Um, that's incredible. But then also 
the misinformation and the hysteria and the fake news. That's the dark side and the downside of social media. But the fact that we can make memes and use humor to get through this and connect and comfort with each other, I think that's also an important thing is to have a sense of humor through this and just keep that human connection. But I guess really the point of this podcast, I want to talk about what's on my heart and it's the elderly, it's the people with weakened immune systems who are vulnerable to the grim potential of this virus. I feel for the elderly people who are worried to go to the grocery store but need to stock up on groceries and they they have to brave the unknown and they have to go out into society and go to the grocery stores and people in their 70s or 80s who are worried because they are the ones who are most at risk. People with susceptible, vulnerable immune systems and pre-existing conditions. Um, and it really hits personally, as I was talking about with the cultural shift, uh, with, you know, LA and a city hallmarked for hedonism and putting yourself first and pleasure and, you know, like who cares if the world is ending, we're going to live it up today. Like that person, that mindset, I'm not going to lie. That was me a week ago. I was like, forget this, like whatever, if this happens, it happens. But then slowly as this evolves and snowballs, I've realized that that attitude is utterly selfish because, it's not me. It's not my peers who are going to be impacted by this or possibly die from this. It's going to be our grandparents or our parents or the people with uh, immune deficiencies or um, pre-existing conditions, HIV, or people who have respiratory issues, asthma. Those are the ones that are going to be impacted. And by going out and by ignoring this and ignoring the precautions, you, you're hurting others. I want to talk about my dad because this is who I worry about. This is what's on my heart. And my dad is my biggest hero. I mean, he's been living with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease for almost five years. He's a doctor's textbook definition of who should be concerned about this virus. I mean, he checks all the boxes. He has a pre-existing condition. He has a weakened immune system. He's in that vulnerable age bracket. Um, and for those who don't know uh, what ALS is, it's a neurological muscle disease. It's the same disease Stephen Hawking's had. Um, basically, your brain stops telling your muscles how to work. So my dad can no longer walk. He can no longer talk. He gets around in a motor wheelchair. Uh, he can't eat. He types with one finger to write messages to communicate with us. And he's actually, in the past couple weeks, started using eye gaze technology to communicate with us so he doesn't have to type with one finger um, which I'm sure is exhausting for him because it's incredibly difficult for him to make any movement and typing on an iPhone is no longer easy for him. So he relies on caregivers to help him with pretty much everything. Um, but the one thing that he does have when this disease has stripped so much away from him, the one thing he has is an absolutely unbreakable spirit. He is strong in his faith. He is resilient. He doesn't have anger. He has hope. He still has humor. When his eyes light up, I can literally see his soul shine through him. And I'm reminded he's exactly the same person inside, despite his outer physical exterior failing him. So with that said, I want to read my blog post I wrote yesterday. Um, I put this on my blog, saratrotmedia.com. I posted it on Instagram and I kind of just wanted to chat it out and hear people's opinions about it um, because everyone has an opinion on this and I wanted to share mine. So here I go. I'm going to read this blog post. It's titled coronavirus in my humble opinion. Everyone has an opinion about what's going on. Here's mine. But first some facts. This is now labeled a global pandemic. We're all in this together. Now hear me out. If this blows over in a few weeks, I have no doubt the people who listened to the precautions stayed home Refuse to go into work and practice social distancing will be seen as the ones who overreacted, who acted out of hysteria. They'll be called the silly ones, seen as ridiculous for panicking or stocking their pantries. But really, if this blows over in a couple weeks, which would be the best case scenario, it will be because of the ones who stayed home, who took this seriously, who helped prevent this disease from spreading exponentially. 
Don't get me wrong, talking about this now, even writing this blog post, is just about as uncomfortable as talking politics to friends or telling a partner you have an STD. Nobody wants to be in this position. It's uncomfortable. It's uncharted waters. It's ugly and awkward. However, what I find most interesting is the way people react and cope to what's happening. Panic, denial, a combination of the two. I currently live in Los Angeles, a city hallmarked for hedonism, the pursuit of personal pleasure. It's no surprise to see so many people embrace the fuck it attitude. And to be honest, that was me a week ago. But now it's hard for me to see that attitude as anything but utterly selfish. Let's be clear, this disease will not kill me or my peers. We are healthy, strong, young adults. But this virus will very likely impact our parents and grandparents. Those are the ones who face the grim potential of this virus. For me, the fuck it attitude hits personally. I drive two and a half hours each way from Los Angeles to San Diego almost every week to visit my ailing father. He's approaching his fifth year in his battle with ALS Lou Gehrig's disease. He has a pre-existing condition, a weakened immune system. He's a doctor's textbook definition of who should be worried about this. Because of the uncertainty of coronavirus, I haven't been home to see him. Simply because as of now, there's no way to know if I'm carrying a strain of this virus that could kill him. So when people downplay the seriousness of this health crisis, I'm left with an uncomfortable combination of hurt and confusion. I'm not sure what it would take for people to start taking this seriously a friend or a loved one to be diagnosed with COVID? For someone in your circle or outer circle to pass away from it? In a strange way, I'm jealous of those who don't have grandparents or ill parents to worry about. But for those of us who do, our worldview is different. You don't have to agree with us, but I would hope you would respect our worries. This is bigger than all of us. I'll end this post with a bit of comfort. Here's a passage from author C.S. Lewis on living in an atomic era written in the 1940s. I first heard this from the New York Times, the daily podcast. Please read. In one way, we think a great deal too much of the atomic bomb. How are we to live in an atomic age? I'm tempted to reply. Why, as you would have lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year, or as you would have lived in a Viking age when raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat at any night, or indeed, as you are already living in an age of cancer, an age of syphilis, an age of paralysis, an age of air raids, an age of railway accidents, an age of motor accidents. In other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, dear sir, madam, you and all of whom you love are already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb was invented and quite a high percentage of us were going to die in unpleasant ways. We had indeed one very great advantage over our ancestors, anesthetics, but we have that still. It is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of painful and premature death to a world which already bristled with such chances and in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. This is the first point to be made, and the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we are all going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pint and a game of darts, not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies, a microbe can do that but they need not dominate our minds. With that, I hope this finds you well. I hope this finds you healthy. I am praying for our world. I'm praying for you. And I just hope we can all get through this together. Thanks for listening. And please, as always, like, comment, subscribe. Let me know how you're handling all of this, how you're holding up, and what you're doing to stay safe or process this world we live in. Hope everyone stays healthy, and I'll talk to you guys soon.